Hi, it's Mr. Anderson, and in this podcast, I'm going to talk about all of molecular biology. Before I get there, I want to talk about a story close to home. In the 1970s, some researchers went to Yellowstone Park. They're in the, the geyser basin. They pulled these bacteria out called Thermus aquaticus, and from that, they pulled out an enzyme called TAC polymerase. That means Thermus aquaticus polymerase, or the DNA polymerase found in this bacteria. Cool thing about it is that it can handle really high temperatures and survive. And the whole genetic engineering molecular biology is built upon this enzyme. So we're talking about trillions of dollars. How much of that goes back into Yellowstone Park? None. And so they've changed their policy on that. But it's a great way to kind of frame this idea of molecular biology and how important it is. When I was thinking of how I wanted to explain this in a way that made sense, I always kind of fall back on an analogy. And so basically what I want to talk about is how we've gone over the last last 30 or 40 years to the point where we now know all the DNA inside a human. And so basically, think about it this way. Imagine if you look at these magazines right here, there's a whole bunch of information that's found inside here. There's a whole bunch of text inside here. And basically, if I could take all of the text that I want and make something out of it, like a really cool ransom note, um, then I would be manipulating that text. And so I want to kind of use this as an analogy for what we've done in molecular biology. And so what was the first thing that was ever done? Well, the first ransom note ever in the terms of molecular biology looked something like this. And you might say, that's not very impressive. Basically, what is it? It's like cutting out letters from a magazine but turning it upside down so you can't see the letters. And so what was the first thing that we were able to do is we were able to cut the DNA. And we do that using an, a restriction enzyme. But you should think of a restriction enzyme like a scissors. It's able to cut the um, DNA. How do we paste DNA? Well, basically to paste DNA, the glue stick equivalent of that is hydrogen bond. Uh, DNA will just come back together again once it's been cut because of the hydrogen bonds. What's the next ransom note? Well, it would look something like this. Basically, it was the first recombinant DNA. We took DNA from a frog, if I remember right, and a bacteria, and they were able to combine those two using this hydrogen bonding. But again, a not very impressive ransom note. Next thing that happened was something like this. So you can see in here that what we're doing is we're actually ordering these little fragments cut out of a magazine from small to large. But again, you can't see what the letters are. So that's called gel electrophoresis. And then we developed something called PCR, polymerase chain reaction, where we made a copy of that. And so if this is that original, in PCR, we make a duplicate of that. And we make an exact duplicate. So every duplicate that we make from that is going to be exactly the same. And that's what PCR does. It makes copies of DNA that's exactly the same. Okay, what's the next advancement? Well, the advent of the marker. So a marker is basically going to be a little section of DNA that marks that specific DNA. So if you read that there's, they found the marker or the genetic marker for breast cancer, that means that there's uh, a piece of DNA that's inherited by all people who have this genetically based um, breast cancer. And then finally, we get to where we are today. So right now, we've used DNA sequencers to figure out all the letters inside our DNA, but it's hieroglyphics. In other words, you can't really read what it means. We know what all the letters are, but we don't know where the genes are, or what the genes express. In other words, what proteins they make. And so when we look at this ransom note, this is the future. This is where we want to get, um, but we're still quite a ways out. And so basically, going back to the big things in this talk that you'll need to remember, first one is the scissors. The role of the scissors will be played by restriction enzymes. The role of the glue will be hydrogen bonds that are found within the DNA. The ruler or the measuring device is something called gel electrophoresis. To copy that, we use the polymerase chain reaction. And then to actually read it, we use something called a DNA sequencer or uh, a gene sequencer. It's going to look at all of the letters. Even though we might not what, know what they do, we can find them right now. So let's start with the scissors, and that's a restriction enzyme. Where do restriction enzymes come from? Well, basically, they come from bacteria, because bacteria have been locked in this million-year war with viruses. And the viruses, you can see, inject their DNA into the bacteria DNA, and they make more viruses. And so how do you fight back? Well, basically what they do is they methylate their DNA, first of all. What does methylate mean? You basically add a methyl group to all of their DNA from the bacteria 
to protect it, and then they're going to secrete these or create these restriction enzymes. And what the enzymes do is they chop up or cut DNA. Since all of the bacterial DNA is protected by these methyl groups, what it's really going to chop up is all this foreign DNA. And so all of that viral DNA is broken apart, and then the bacteria, after it's done that, can return to its specific shape. So let me show you how a restriction enzyme works. So if this is a section of DNA, a real common restriction enzyme is something called ECOR1. It comes from the word E. coli. Um, this is a restriction enzyme 1. And basically what it'll do is it'll scan the DNA until it finds this specific sequence, and it's literally going to cut it in half. And so if I were to find that, where is that going to be up here? Well, you can see we have a GAAT, so it's going to cut right like that through here. And it's going to go all the way to the end, and it's going to cut it in half like that. And so if we take a look at that, basically what will it do? It will break that into two fragments. If we take another one, oh, well, did you see that? It came right back together again. So what brings it back together again? There are going to be little hydrogen bonds here between those two ends. And in fact, we call this a sticky end and this a sticky end because there are going to be hydrogen bonds formed between the two. And so once the enzyme gone, it comes right back together again. If we look at another one, this is the hind D3 enzyme. Basically, it's going to cut between these two A's. And so we'd cut it right here, all the way down here. And it's going to cut it into two fragments like that. If we apply that enzyme that was found in this specific type of bacteria, if it goes away, then it comes right back together again. What if we add both of those enzymes? What's it going to do? Well, it's going to cut it into two, in two points or two restriction sites, and then we're going to have three fragments that come from that. So those are restriction enzymes. What do we use them for in molecular biology? Basically, to cut DNA and then to glue it back together again, all you need is uh, hydrogen bonds. And so the first recombinant DNA, that of a frog and a bacteria, how did they get together? Basically they cut them both with the same enzyme, they had the same sticky ends, and then they were able to come back together again. What's the next one that we have to do? So what we've done is shown you how to cut, that's a restriction enzyme, how to glue, that's hydrogen bond. Now we have to figure out how to separate the DNA according to its length. And so to do that, let me talk about pachinko machines. Pachinko machines are essentially these vertical machines. They're really popular in Japan. You put a ball up at the top, you usually flick the ball up at the top, and then that ball is going to bounce down. And if it eventually goes where you want it to go, if it get, eventually goes into a little cup down here at the bottom, then you might get more of those balls back. But in that case, it wouldn't. So imagine a game of pachinko where we had one ball like this that's bouncing its way down. And then we had, instead of another ball, we had like eight balls that are attached together. So something like that. So what would happen to them if we drop them in a pachinko machine? Does it make sense that they're sometimes going to go slower, they're going to wrap around, it's going to take them way longer to get down to the bottom? And so the single pachinko ball would already be at the bottom where this big chain of pachinko balls isn't even made it very far. And so how does that apply in DNA? Well, think of DNA instead of pachinko. So basically, if we were to take a small fragment of DNA, it's going to work its way farther down through that pachinko machine sooner than one of these big fragments. And again, we don't use pachinko machines, but we do use gel electrophoresis. And so how does this work? Basically, inside you have a gel. The gel is kind of the consistency of jello. It's going to have little wells on one side where you insert the DNA. And what's pulling the DNA? Well, in a pachinko machine, it's going to be the gravity. But here you can see that there is a red cable. That means there's a positive charge on this end. So there's a positive electrode all the way across. There's going to be a negative electrode. You can see it right back here on this side. So basically, the DNA is going to migrate across that gel. DNA has a negative charge, so it's going to be pulled towards the positive end. And so if we look at this, this is kind of that. If you've ever heard of like a DNA fingerprint, what's going on? Well, basically, the DNA is going to be pulled in this direction. We could say this, since it's been on for a while, that this fragment right here is going to be bigger than this fragment right here, because this small fragment has made its way farther from these original wells where it was up here. And lots of times you'll run a ladder as well. A ladder is a bunch of DNA with known distances or known quantities. And so you can read across and see how big is that? How many, how many nucleotide pairs do we have? When we do this in class, we use a dye called ethidium bromide. And basically it'll dye the DNA. You can put it under uh, black light and you can see where the DNA is. It's normally clear. You can't see it. Okay, what's the next thing we have to do? Remember, we have to now that we've sorted it according to its length, now we have to make copies of it. And to do that, we use the polymerase chain reaction, or PCR. This was invented by Kerry Mullis. Uh, he was riding his motorcycle one day and came up with this idea. And so to do that, we need a few extra things in our PCR machine. One thing we need is a primer. Primer is going to be 
a little section of DNA that will grab onto the DNA. It will allow that polymerase to drive down the DNA. Now where's TAC polymerase from? Remember it's that bacteria. Because in the PCR we're going to heat this up really hot. What else do we need? We need nucleotides, so we need new letters. And so let's check this out. Basically we put it in a PCR machine, which looks kind of like a photocopier. You put your DNA in the top, and then it's going to quickly heat it and cool it and heat it and cool it. And so as it heats this, it's going to unzip that DNA in the middle. It's going to break all those hydrogen bonds. What's the next thing that's added? Well, the next thing that will be added is going to be the primer. The primer is going to bond to the complementary sides of the DNA. Now, we create the primer because it's going to target a specific gene that we want. What happens next? Well, once the primer is in place, then TAC polymerase is going to grab on. Now, this looks familiar. If you know anything about DNA replication, how does that work? Well, we unzip our DNA. It's helicase that does that. We put a primer down and then it's going to be DNA polymerase inside us that makes copies of our DNA. But in a PCR machine it's TAC polymerase and the reason why is TAC polymerase can, can withstand these really hot temperatures. Okay watch carefully what happens next. Well basically as the TAC polymerase runs in either direction it's going to add complementary letters to either side. And so basically what do we have? We had one strand of DNA now we have two. So the P PCR machine will cycle. It'll again heat up the DNA, so it unzips those hydrogen bonds. We're going to add primer on either side. TAC polymerase is going to grab on, and as it races down, we're going to produce complementary sides. And again, heat it up. We're going to unzip the sides. The primer is added on. TAC polymerase on. And now we have, if you look at it, we've now got eight strands of DNA. And so this just in a few minutes we've gone from one to two to four to eight. And now we just get 16. You get that exponential growth. And so we can make a whole bunch of DNA very, very quickly. So we're almost to the end. What's the last thing in our analogy of the ransom note is really reading what those letters are. And to do that we use a DNA sequencer. DNA sequencer sometimes is hard to explain. Basically, if you were to Google the Sanger method, you'd find some videos that might help a little more. But basically, it's like a PCR machine. So if you look down here, we got the primer, we got the TAC polymerase, we got our letters, but then we have these three or these four special letters. They're called dideoxynucleotides. And so they're just like adenine, cytosine, thymine, and guanine, but they have a specific color. And so what happens, you'll heat it up, primer will be added, TAC polymerase will be added, and then we're going to start adding those letters. And so if I were to go across, if there's a T here, there'd be an A here and a T and a G and a C and we'll say that's a T and a T. C, G, G, C, A, A. Okay, so usually it's just going to make copies of it. But occasionally as it makes those copies, instead of putting a regular A in, it'll put one of these weird A's in there. And what that weird A is going to do is it's going to be dyed. It's going to have a specific color and it's also going to stop the sequence. And so basically you can't add new letters. And so a lot of the time you'll get a regular run-of-the-mill copied DNA strand, but occasionally you'll get these fragments that just have an A at the front and they have a specific color, which is going to be green. Um, maybe we run it again the next time and the A seems normal, but the next one is a T that's weird. And so that's going to stop it at that point, but it's going to give it a color of red. Or maybe another time we're going to get an A and a T and a G, but then we're going to put a weird C on there and that's going to stop it. And the C is going to have this blue color. And so basically what you can do is then run gel electrophoresis. All these fragments are going to run through a gel electrophoresis machine, uh, or running a gel. And basically what they're going to do is they're going to separate according to their fragment length. Well, what's the smallest fragment which went the farthest? That's going to be this little fragment of A with the weird A at the beginning. And so what does that tell us? Well, it tells us that the first letter is going to be an A. And so a computer can go through and read all these colors and it can read the sequence of the DNA. It can figure out the letter letters in our DNA. And so the Human Genome Project, that was the job of that, to sequence all of the DNA in a human. This is, these are the DNA sequencing machines, but what I want you to remember is that we've sequenced all of the DNA in a typical human, and as you grow up they'll be able to sequence all the DNA specifically inside you. But at this point, we're kind of right here. We've got the DNA, we know the order that it's in, but we don't know what proteins those make or how those proteins interact. And so the next project after the Human Genome Project is the Human Proteome uh, Project. And so uh, that's a lot, I know, um, but I hope that's helpful.